Thank you for joining us for this online program sponsored by Mechanics Institute. The Writer's Lunch is a casual and virtual brown bag lunch activity on the third Friday of each month. Look forward to craft discussion, informal presentations on all forms of writing, and excellent conversation. My name is Nico Chen, and I am the program manager here at, program, uh, at Mechanics Institutes. Um, I would also like to introduce you to Janice. Can you wave to the crowd? We also have Cheryl, and we also have Matthew. We welcome you to um, our writer's lunch today. And for those who are new to Mechanics Institute, welcome. Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. Mechanics Institute features a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the cinema lit film series. A recent article in the San Francisco Standard describes this as the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a remote work sanctuary. Come see this for yourself by joining us for a free tour, which happens every Wednesday at noon. We also offer a plethora of free events for our Mechanics Institute members, such as the next storytelling showcase on December 20th. Join us on site in our fourth floor meeting room for an evening of laughter and storytelling. Local author and host of The Moth, Corey Rosen, will host a dynamic night of storytelling developed in his Your Story Well Told workshops. Come hear stories and jokes being told for the first time with some performers making their stage debut. We also have some exciting new programming coming up in 2024. For those of you who teach or facilitate workshops as your day jobs, join us for our inaugural Teacher Tea at Mechanics Institute on Saturday, January 13th. We'll start with an opening reception at 1 p.m., during which we will network with other educators, participate in hands-on activities, and enjoy light snacks and tea. Starting at 2 p.m., we'll transition into a thought-provoking book talk and Q&A with Mariah Rankin Landers and Jessa Bree Moreno from Studio Pathways, authors of their recently published book, Do Your Lessons, Love Your Students, Creative Education mm -hmm. for Social Change. Mariah and Jessa will be sharing their insights and experience to enhance your teaching approach. Get inspired and ready to create meaningful connections in your classroom or workshop. Find out more about our wide selection of upcoming programs at Mechanics Institute by going to milibrary.org, click on events in our top menu bar to begin searching and registering for the course or events of your choice. Today's theme for our writer's lunch, and let me make sure to admit everybody into our room again, there we are, is <laughs> the value of writing retreats. This discussion will include a Q&A with our audience, so remember to add your questions to the chats and I will read them aloud. And you're welcome to ask questions um, when the floor opens at 1240. Please also mark your calendars for the Writer's Lunch on Friday, January 19th for the topic, How to Craft a Bio, with Joey Garcia, Jeannie Grossenbacher, and Jillian Hamel. This event will be moderated by the one and only Cheryl J. Bizet Boutte. And I will go on to our bios. Award-winning author and Pushcart Prize nominee, Cheryl J. Bizet-Boutte is an Oakland multidisciplinary writer whose autobiographical and fictional short story collections, along with her lyrical and stunning poetry, artfully succeeds in getting across deeper meanings about the politics of race and economics without breaking out of the narrative. An inaugural Oakland Poet Laureate runner-up, she is also a popular teacher literary reader, presenter, storyteller, curator, and MC host for literary and poetry events. Let's give a warm welcome to Cheryl. Next, we have Matthew Felix. Matthew Felix is an author, certified life coach, speaker, and podcaster, including former program director and host of the San Francisco Writers Conference podcasts. Publishers Weekly's Book Life Prize called his debut novel, a Voice Beyond Reason, a highly crafted gem. His travel collection with open arms topped Amazon's Africa category in its Morocco one four times. And his latest book, Porcelain Travels, won Reader's Favorite Award, Gold, for humor and was a Forward Indies Book of the Year Award finalist. Matthew also edits, designs, publishes, and markets books for other authors. Let's give a warm welcome to the wonderful Matthew Felix. Thank you. 
Last but not least, we have Janice Cook Newman. Janice Cook Newman is the author of two novels, A Master Plan for Rescue, which was an SF Chronicle Best Book of the Year, and Mary, which was an LA Times Book Prize finalist, as well as USA Today's Historical Novel of the Year. She is also the author of a memoir, The Russian Word for Snow, which has been translated into several languages. Newman is the founder of Lit Camp, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting writers and helping them find community. She is also the founder of Page Street, co-working spaces for writers in both San Francisco and Berkeley. In addition, she developed the online platform for writers, Creative Caffeine Daily. Let's give a warm welcome to Janice Cook Newman, and I will now pass the mic over to the wonderful Cheryl Bazet Boutte. Thank you so much, Nico, and thank you, Janice, and thank you, Matthew. I'm going to jump right in with my first question. Um, and, and Janice, I'll pose it to you first. What do you see as the major benefits of writing retreats? I'm gonna say it's getting out of your house. Um, there is a lot to be said for <laughs> changing your environment um, and going away and separating yourself from the day to day of your life. And so a writing retreat, when you pull yourself away from your life, you can turn your attention to your work, to the story of the world you're trying to create there. So I think they're invaluable, actually. I've always done them, right, my entire writing career. And what about you, Matthew? What do you think the major benefits of writing retreats can be? Well, I agree with Janice that that getting out of your house and not only getting out of your house but and this is implied in what janice just said but getting out of your day-to-day -day life to me that is unquestionably the number one benefit um just because it's it's you know it can be i always say that the biggest challenge for me as a creative isn't inspiration you know a lot of people mm -hmm. who aren't necessarily creative say well how do you get inspired right for me it's finding the time and the space with with all the responsibilities and distractions that we have in our day to day, that for me is always the biggest challenge. So when I go on a retreat, I'm able to get out of my day to day life, get away from those distractions and those responsibilities, whether it's for a weekend or a week or a month, and just focus on whether it's starting a new work or finishing a new work. But then I think there are other benefits and, and they, they depend on the type of retreat that you're taking, right? A lot of times I'll go off by myself and do a solo retreat. Other times I go on group retreats where I might be looking for inspiration or I might be lurking to make new connections. I've made so many friends and so many writing colleagues from, from retreats. And sometimes there's a learning component. Sometimes there are classes at the retreats, right? Sometimes it's just about, about getting the work done. Um, but circling back, I think the biggest thing is, yeah, just getting out of our day-to-day -day lives, getting out of our homes and just focusing on the work. Well, let me let me continue um, with you, uh, Matthew. Do you think the total isolation retreat is really possible? I mean, the world does enter in. No matter where you are in the world, the world is there. Um, so, can you really can you really achieve that total isolation? And is it desirable? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you can totally achieve it, but I've had great success at getting to ninety percent. You know. Um, and, you know, I think it depends where you go. Yeah, if I, as I've done, go to a cabin in the woods and I unplug the Wi-Fi, I'm pretty isolated, you know? I mean, other than the deer and the foxes who might be, you know, coming up to the cabin window. Um, or what I've done a lot is go overseas to a place where, um, not some place that I'm dying to explore, because that can become a distraction in and of itself, but in some place that maybe I know, like I've spent a lot of time in Spain and France. So I might go back to some place that I already know, but that I don't know a lot of people. And, and yeah, you're right. I'm not complete. That's like I said, maybe a 90% sort of thing. If, mm -hmm. if I really want to finish my book, I was in Barcelona and I would stay up from 11 to three and four and five in the morning, just cranking my book. I didn't even go to the beach for a month, you know, one time when I went over there because I was so in the zone. So I think a lot of this comes back to also, you know, your work style, right? Yeah. And and what the stakes are, you know, for me, when I'm getting close to the end of something, I'm able to stay a lot more focused because the end is within sight. Yeah. So, so is it desirable? For me, it's really desirable. But again, 
some people might start to feel lonely. Some people might need that inspiration and support of their fellow writers. So maybe a group thing, you know, or even two or three going away with two or three writer friends might be better for them. So I think that's what are your objectives? What's your work style? Um, I'm a loner with good social skills. So I, especially if I've got a project to work on, that really does work for me, but it's not going to work for everybody. Yeah. I see that. So, so Janice, what about you? Um, do you think well, that total isolation is possible and or desirable? Uh, I think sometimes it's very desirable and it is possible. I know one place we could all drive to. <laughs> it is down in Big Sur. It is a silent monastery and it's known as New Kamaldoli or the Hermitage. No Wi-Fi, no cell phone. Uh, you don't have to think about your food because the monks make the food and leave it in the kitchen. There is no talking. Um, I have gone there on my own and I've also brought groups there. And I think it's a wonderful resource. It's also very reasonable. And every room has a view, unobstructed view of the ocean and a desk and power. And that is uh, all you need. <laughs> And so um, I actually, I think it's, it was enlightening the last time I was there. I didn't realize how obsessively I checked my email. Ah. And, right. And then <laughs> suddenly I had like all this didn't. time. <laughs> yeah. Until you didn't, you didn't know how. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I do think it's there. I think if you are disciplined <clears throat> and as Matthew said, your work style, um, and or you are in a final draft where you need to hold a whole book in your head at the same time, those solo retreats in a very isolated place like that, I think are really great. Well, but you Luke, do have to, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go finish your, your point. I was going to say, you do just have to like your own company. Yeah, that's very important. Uh, but Janice, so we've talked uh a bit about you know people doing retreats that you, Matthew you you can travel uh, you have Janice you have a place you can go to you can drive to what about the writer who doesn't have the resources to do all of those things um, I wonder how you can retreat within yourself and and when you can't get out of your house any any tricks of the trade for that that you can advise people about. Janice? Um, I think I would have more credibility if I've ever been able to do that for myself. <laughs> I'm not sure I have. <laughs> um, I would say if, I'm sure it's possible. I have not been very good at that. Um, my house is too distracting. But I think if you thought about a house swap, if you thought about uh -huh. house sitting, so that you, you're not spending money, but you are getting out of your your usual environment. I still think that that would at least make it easier for you. I don't know, Matthew, have you ever tried it like on your own? Well, yeah, one of the things that I've done sort of um, when I want to work at home, not necessarily a full fledged retreat, but when I was working nine to five before I went freelance and was trying to nonetheless still progress on my creative endeavors, my novel at the time, what I would do to create sort of a mini retreat each week, because I knew I had to allocate that time, and I'm not a morning person, I'm not someone who could get up and, and work before work, is every Sunday, <clears throat> I set the expectation with all of my friends and family, I am not available on Sundays. And that includes, so I created a cocoon basically at home where I would turn off the phone so people would know, you know, you can call me, but you're not going to hear from me. I'm not going to respond to your texts thereby also eliminating, setting the expectation with my friends and family so they're not reaching out, but also creating that boundary, having that discipline to turn off my phone so I'm not tempted, um, unplugging the Wi-Fi, I mean, unless I need to use the dictionary and stuff online, because now we have all these tools online, but um, a lot of times I will, I'll turn the Wi-Fi off on my computer, maybe, so the emails aren't coming in, or I'll shut down the browser that has the email window. So, creating that boundary within my space and then I live in the middle of San Francisco and sometimes the the noise can my neighbors the, my <laughs> building is made of tissue paper I'm pretty sure right and so sometimes you know the people above the people below 
And so part of also creating that cocoon for me when I can't get out and I want to get something done is I've started listening to the white noise. You know, I, I'll stay online. I'll put YouTube on. There's all these white noise recordings that we can listen to for free. And I'll do that to block out the noise. So setting the expectations, finding the, the peace and quiet, even when otherwise it might not be possible, turning off the distractions. And um, and I'm able to be productive in that way. Not to the same degree, obviously, as getting overseas. But, you know, Cheryl, we can't always do that. We might not have the means. We might not have the time. That's right. So this or is a nice more. sort of, yeah. Or the desire. Or the uh, desire, yeah, because yeah, there's right. a lot of effort I kind of find that, uh, I, you know, I have a room in my house. They, you know, you, you people talk about their writer's room and that sort of thing. And 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 like you, I, the family has to understand the expectations when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. My retreat is into my writing. I retreat right into the, the story I'm writing. That's where I go. Um, and so then when I'm finished for the day or whatever, then I break out of that retreat. But uh, my next question really is, um, Matthew, can you take us to one of your retreats and tell us what you did and how you felt when you were writing at that retreat? So I was finishing uh, my novel, my my first real book, because um, it's not it's the second one I published, but it was it's my first book that I really worked on. And um and I, I was I was getting close to the end and they started renovating the apartment above me. <laughs> and and I thought, oh, that's fine. I'll work in cafes as long as there's white noise in the background. I can usually work in public unless somebody gets on their cell next to me. So I was trying to do that. And then that wasn't working because there were just too many people. It's hard to get a table sometimes at cafes in San Francisco in the middle of the day. So many people now working from home. Uh, so that wasn't working. Tried the library. That wasn't working. So I realized, what am I doing? You know, I. I've had so much success when I have taken myself out of my day to day, I need to get overseas. So I had miles, so I had a free ticket. So I was like, I can do this, you know, relatively inexpensively. It was the off season. So I found a house on Mallorca, the Spanish island of Mallorca. And I wanted, again, I wanted to be isolated. So I found the smallest village on the island. Um, uh, I didn't get a car. It was the off season. The hotel was shut. The restaurant was shut. There's not an ATM. There's not a bank. I mean, no traffic light. Really small, surrounded by nature, because that's what fuels me. And I wanted to be able to move. And so I went and, uh, yeah, I mean, I would basically just get up in the morning. I'm trying to remember my routine. I'd get up in the morning, do some meditation, clear my head, get into my body, work for a little while, have lunch. Then you should go on a hike, whether down to the water, because this village is on the water or up into the mountains, just to move, because I think that's so part of the creative process, as well as our physical well-being is just keeping everything in motion. And then go back and work for another couple hours, and then maybe have dinner. And then, like I mentioned earlier, I work a lot at night. I'm just a night owl. So I would go for longer stretches, really productive, reproductive stretches uh, in the evenings. So... And that just worked again because I didn't know anyone. And I, of course, over time I did meet people, but um, it was just, it, it was quiet. It was inspiring. And I just had that clear focus and I was able to stick to it because of the lack of distractions and, and the day-to-day -day responsibilities. And it was great. Nice. And I my book. Yeah. Good. Sounds good. <laughs> Janice, take us to one of your retreats. Uh, would you like me to take you to a personal retreat or one of the ones I lead? Whichever you'd like to do. Your <laughs> is Dana's choice. Okay. <laughs> no wrong answer. Uh, all That's right. right. No wrong I'll, answer. I'll, I'll jump into one I recently led um, because I, when I do them on my own, I usually do them with friends and there's similarities. But um, I most recently led one at Green Gulch Farm in Marin County. We took over the guest house. So there were, I think, 11 of us all together. And the way that um, I like to structure these is to give people a lot of time to write and just enough structure so they don't feel sort of at odds and ends. So typically your morning is, is yours. We all get up, we some of us walk, some of us write, I usually write. Um, and we gather around 1130 before lunch, which is typically a time when if you started writing in the morning, you're tired. 
at that time, then I would do generally an exercise with them. Um, I frequently teach a workshop at SLN called Writing and Mindfulness. And it's sort of how you can use mindfulness and meditation to feed your writing. So I may do a session there where we talk about getting emotion on the page or writing from the body with a little craft and some free writing. Then we have lunch and people are again are on their own in the afternoon. Um, I agree with Matthew about some physical exercise. So very often late in the day, we will around four, we'll walk often to the Pelican Inn for oysters, <laughs> but it's a walk. There's dinner. And then this I think is really important. We gather after dinner and everyone is invited to read up to three minutes of whatever they've been working on that day. I do this at all my retreats um, and I even do it on the personal ones. We open some wine and we read for each other. It's so motivating. And you can say to yourself like all day, oh, if I just finished this scene, I could read it tonight. And we read it only to applause. This is not about feedback, critique, because we all know it's rough writing. So we read it to applause. So that in a nutshell is sort of how those retreats look. And may I, may I add something to that? Please. So because I've been to three of Janice's lit camp retreats, two as an attendee and one as faculty, and that, that three minute evening reading that she just mentioned does help you as a writer to get motivated because you know you have sort of a, a, a deadline. But it's also just, and this is why I like the group retreats as well as the solo retreats. And Janice is just fabulous at running her own. Um, but but it's not just that it motivates you to get your work done during the day. I just always come away from that that group setting and, and the readings and, and the applauding so inspired by what everybody else is doing. Yeah. And then it's, it's infectious, right? And so that's right. one of the great things about doing the group retreats is you just, you come away so inspired and, and you just want to write that much more. So that's, that's just a great angle on, on why it can be great to go away with, with other, other writers. Almost like writing church. Mm -hmm. Just like writing church. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny you yeah. say that, that Cheryl, uh -huh. because um, I have, I'm always using the analogy because, you know, we have these co-working spaces where we all go write silently and my analogy is always, it's it's sort of the different, the same as, you know, when you meditate in the Zendo with all the other people, Yeah, it's so much easier than when you're sitting on the cushion by yourself in your house. And it just carries right over to your writing. To be in a space with all these other people with the same intention, doing the same thing you're doing, it, there's an energy there. It's very motivating. So what, what are some of your major success stories? There's just a couple of major success stories of writers who've come out of your retreats or even how you felt successful uh, at a retreat, um, Janice? Uh, well, it's a, it's a timely question because uh, a dear friend of mine, whose name is Nancy Kelly, was a filmmaker, was on my most recent one, the one I was describing to you. And she just wrote to me to say that she finished the screenplay that she had been working on there. Wow. So she pushed it to the place where she could get it done. Wow. Yeah, that was really gratifying. I personally do not think I would have ever finished any of my three books had I not gone on some version of a writing retreat. Wow, it's interesting. Good to know. Matthew? Yeah. Success? Success. Um, well, I don't know that this is what you're necessarily getting at, but but one of the, what I feel is sort of a success, I mean, first of all, I finished my book, right? So I did mention yeah, that already. Success. So that was, that was, that was success. Um, but another form of success that comes again from the group ones is just the connections I end up making and that's making. And, and that's a success just because it's just so enriching professionally and personally, and you end up carrying forward these relationships that you make and, and it helps you be successful and it helps you help others yeah. have success. So I know that wasn't necessarily directly hitting the question, but that's, that what, that's what comes up for me. There's just, um, 
there's just that 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 feeling of camaraderie and taking you and bringing your other writers along with you to the next level that can come from these these retreats a lot of the times that's just feels feels so good and fulfilling cool hey nico do we have any questions from the audience um currently we have um, a comment from the audience uh from shital she says uh, hearing other people's writing helps me get to know them better. It's a very intimate thing to do. Uh, read your work aloud to other people. It builds community. So I think she was just commenting on the value of being able to be in community with others. And Doug um, also added, so I'm hearing that coming to a retreat with specific intentionality, particularly uh, finishing a project, is recommended. Would you guys agree with what um, both audience members have added to the chat box? Um, well, I definitely agree with Sheetal because she's been on retreats with me <laughs> <laughs> and she's a member of our co-working space. So yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but I, I think Doug has a good point. I mean, I have led retreats where people come to figure out what they wanna do, but, and that's fine, you can do that too. But if you go with some intentionality, you have that goal in front of you. But many of the other people who come, they're usually people who have small children. And for them, it's just, I'm going to come to this to, to think, to just get some quiet inside my head to figure out what <laughs> I want to do next. Yeah. Which I guess is an intention. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about that, Matthew? I think I would navigate. Yeah. I mean, I think it's always good to have intentions and to have clarity on kind of what we're hoping to achieve um, including with regards to retreats. But I also think that there's a difference between intentions and expectations. And sometimes I've ended up at a retreat thinking I was going to, you know, finish that chapter or write five chapters or whatever the intention might have been. And then been surprised by what actually happened at the retreat because, again, maybe I make an interesting new connection. Maybe there's a class, if, if it's a class, if it's a retreat that has, you know, an, an educational component. Um, maybe I get inspired or led down a different route than I was necessarily expecting. And so it might be okay that I didn't, that I don't necessarily accomplish what I was thinking or hoping I was going to accomplish if something else came up in the moment. Um, so I try to balance the intention with not having too many expectations and being open to whatever opportunities or inspiration might end up presenting themselves. So as, as a coach, how do you manage that for others, for the, the writers that work with you? I mean, how do you navigate through that to make sure that uh, even if they come with an intention, that they're not stifling their own creativity and individuality, trying to stick with that stringent line? How do, how do you coach that? Well, I think I would encourage people. Uh, I mean, we create our own realities and a lot of that mm -hmm. our realities end up being constructed by limiting beliefs. And, and if we get too stuck by this is what I have to do, or this is what I should do, or this is what I must do. And if we're talking in the context of a retreat, for example, then I would challenge the writer uh, to kind of recognize, okay, well, if we're saying should, must, have to, because this is what I said I was going to do, are you potentially limiting your experience and what you can get out of it? And part of that, again, in this particular context would be, I think when inspiration strikes, oftentimes it strikes in ways that we're not expecting. And it behooves us as creatives to not have this left brain, this is how it's supposed to happen, but rather open to inspiration, open to that flow, and let ourselves kind of be carried by that if that's what we're feeling in the moment. Now, again, I might show up to a retreat saying, I'm going to finish my book and I can see it and stick to that. And that might be honestly, organically what's supposed to happen and happens. And, and in that case, don't want to distract from that. But if there's other stuff going on, other opportunities, other inspiration, then I think it's, it's always good. And this is what I would help people that I'm coaching with to, to question that, to look at the limiting beliefs and ask presently, because your intention was in, is in the past, right? I intended to do X, Y, and Z on this retreat, but presently, what am I feeling? Are those intentions and, and objectives still something I want to, to honor? Or did I show up at Lit Camp in Bell Valley and it's like, oh my God, I met this amazing person who's helping me see a totally different way of approaching this story. Or I met this agent 
who I'm really clicking with. And actually, it's not about me finishing the book right now. It's about me nurturing this connection. So try to, again, try to balance intention and expectation and, and be present and be honest with myself. And and if I were coaching someone, help them to be honest with themselves yeah. about what do they need here and now. Exactly. And Janice, what about you? Um, I think a lot, of, I mean, I love everything Matthew said, so I, I yeah. would echo, I would echo that. Um, I think that part of what gives people permission to write anything are those little generative sessions that I do. I think that in there, you may stumble upon something else. Um, I also think that in the readings at night, if you've kind of gone off track there and written something else and you bring it to the group and people really love it, I think that that will move you along. Um, so it really is up to the individual writer to trust their own process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a hard thing to teach and a hard thing to do. <laughs> I have a good example of that from one of the, uh, one of the retreats that I was on with Janice and it was a writer who got up to do the, the three minute reading at the, in the evening. And she had been writing, I can't remember if it was nonfiction, um, but it wasn't humor. But during the day, she wrote a humorous piece and she got up and read it. And we were all, you know, we all just thought it was hilarious. And she's been writing humor ever since. Right. So if she had stuck to that intention of working on the project she'd brought to the retreat versus saying, you know what, I've got this idea for this funny story. Maybe I'll explore this. You know, she might have missed out on a really interesting opportunity and an interesting new path forward. So that's a wonderful example. Wonderful story. So how do you figure out what writers work best in your retreats, Janice? How, how do you, what, do you have a selection process? What, how do you do it? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, let me say there's two ways to do it. For the Lit Camp retreats, and just a little background, when, when the Lit Camp conference started, um, it was more traditional writers conference with workshops and a retreat. And over the past year, um, I believe so strongly in retreats. And I also am not sure about conferences with workshop because I feel like it pits writers against each other to some extent. So that I altered Lit Camp so that it is more like a writer's retreat with master classes. So, and this is one where I do, I have a selection process because we're going to typically be about 25 people all off together. I, I bring up three very distinguished authors who will each do a master class, but most of their time is also there for them to write. Um, the selection process is, I'm going to say less about the writing than about who the writer is. What I look, what I ask people to do is to write me one page about themselves as a writer. And then I ask them to give me one page of whatever it is they're working on. Um, and I feel like since I have been doing that, the groups have had just a wonderful cohesion. They've been supportive. They've been community minded. Um, I try to weed out people who are just going to be competitive with other writers and who feel like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll impress this Pulitzer Prize winner by running this other writer down. These are the people I don't want there. And so I'm very careful about that kind of selection process when we're talking about the Lit Camp events and we've got like 25 people. How about you, Matthew? You you you're doing your self retreat. So, how how do you figure out um, who to go your, with? Yeah, <laughs> who to go with or where to go for you? Uh, yeah. So no, the who to go with since I'm by myself is easy. Um, the where to go. Well, uh, I mean, as you said, Cheryl, you know, it depends on money. I'm not. I can't run off overseas. You know, every time <laughs> I might like to. So that's part of that. Although if I do go overseas, and I said this earlier, one sort of caveat is that I not go someplace that I haven't yet been that I'm going to want to explore because that's just going to be a distraction. So right. sometimes there are retreats to these wonderful exotic places, but 
if I'm going to go to those wonderful exotic places I haven't been, I might not want to go on that particular retreat. I might want to go there to travel um, versus, like I said, I've lived in Paris and I've lived in Istanbul. There are you know, certain places overseas where I, I already have routines. And so I don't get so distracted. Um, closer to home, for me, it's usually about getting back to nature and again, finding a place that's quiet and I can have a, uh, the time and the space in this, in this case, you know, a literal space that's quiet and then that I can get out and, and have some movement and get some inspiration in nature. So wherever that might be, whether it's a friend, if they've got a place or, um, <clears throat> yeah, some, just any place that sort of meets those criteria. If, if I'm doing a solo retreat. So let me, let me take the question from the other side, the writer's side. And what should a writer look for when they're selecting a coach or a retreat, particularly a retreat? Matthew? For me? Okay. Um, well, I oh, think- Oh, I'm so happy you were first. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean? You can answer this one easily, Janice. You can answer this one easier than I can, I think. Um, but again, I would, I guess I would go back to my earlier comments about what are your objectives and what's your work style, right? As you said, Cheryl, a lot of people don't want to be by themselves, right? And I like both, you know? And so it depends. Yeah. The last uh, lip camp retreat that I went on, I was on the faculty, but the reason I went, I, I, I was looking for, I wanted to hear the agent talk and the publicist talk, and I wanted to reconnect with, um, some people that I knew were going and then I wanted to make new connections. You know, I was in that sort of mindset and um, I had stuff I was working on, but I didn't have, I wasn't finishing a book, you know? So that sort of retreat was more what I was looking for. So what are, where are you in your project? Are you looking more to kind of make connections in the writing community and have a generative experience? You know, you probably want to go on a group one. Uh, you want to look for one that you can afford. You want to look for one that's, you know, um, uh, you know, the right amount of time that you want to spend. Um, or if you just really want to just focus exclusively on your project, you might, you might want to go off by yourself. So I think it's right. what's your work style and what are your objectives? I just kind of come back to that. Janice, what about you? Um, I think the place is really important. Um, you need to look at where it is and think to yourself, will this be a place I feel like I can work? You know, I think a lot of us like a natural environment, but not all. Um, is this place too busy for me? Or is it too remote and I'm gonna feel spooked at night? So you do wanna look at that. Um, you wanna see, is there any structure to the day? Or is it just a free for all, you just write on your own? And maybe you see people, you know, at the meals. Um, I I kind of like a little bit of the structure, but you know, again, you, as Matthew said, you want to see where you are in your process. You may want to look at how many people are going. Like, do you want to be like I have something coming up where I'm only taking six people to San Miguel de Allende, one of whom's on this call today. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that's a really nice small group. That's about the smallest group I've ever done on my own. And that's kind of nice if you're looking for that. But if you're like Matthew and you're gregarious and you want to make more contacts, then you might look at the one where there's 25 people and uh -huh. money. Yeah, I think, you know, you can't underestimate. You, you have to figure out because I see retreats that I think are crazy expensive. Yeah, yeah. And you wonder what people get out of them. You know, if they don't come out with the New York Times bestseller, then why did they spend all that money, right? Well, that would be my thinking for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a good point. I mean, I know you're saying that sort of tongue in cheek, but that's also a good point though. Again, coming back to expectations. Right. You know, don't, and, and ask yourself, if I spend the 5,000 bucks or I'm, I'm sure the sky's the limit with regards to pricing, you know, am I gonna, am I really expecting, it's I'm gonna, gonna be am I, you know, a lot of times if there, if there are agents there, Janice sort of referred to the, or alluded to this earlier, you know, when there was a Pulitzer Prize, you know, the people signing up for the conference might be thinking, I'm going to cozy up to that agent. I'm going to cozy up to that author and they're going to get me connections. They're going to help me get a deal. And if that's part of why they've decided to spend the money, they might be really setting themselves up for disappointment. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to just add really quickly, I liked what Janice said about structure. 
You know, sometimes the retreats can have so much going on that if you're hoping to get some work done, you might not really be getting a lot of work done. It might be more about the learning, about the workshopping, about the uh -huh. connections. So kind of ask yourself that again, what, what am I hoping to accomplish? Am I going on this retreat to get a lot of writing done or am I, do I have, do I want to make connections? Do I want to learn? Do I want to learn about craft or marketing or whatever, whatever it might be. So you could have a conceivably have a writing retreat that has very little writing. Yes. Or a writing retreat that has a whole lot of writing. Right. Uh, or somewhere in between. Uh, and, and everything in between. Right. So, Nico, do we have any um, audience questions? We do. Um, I think our next audience question is from someone who wants to do, who wants to facilitate a more learning oriented retreat. And their question is, I'm planning a workshop writing retreat in Sweet Sun City in late February, somehow more directed, somewhat more directed. How could this work with prompts, breaks, group discussions, or readings in terms of time allocation? Janice? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't we think said it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that there's a right answer to that question. I think you need to figure out what kind of retreat you actually want to run. What, you know, if you know some people who are going to take it. Um, you know, it, it's a mix. And yeah. I, I would call on Sheetal, who was at my, my one with the master classes. Would you say it was half and half, or would you say it skewed a little more to the writing? I think it was a good balance of, of the two. It, it, it really was because the, the talks and the, I won't call them workshops because we weren't workshopping each other's work. Right. We were um, writing, really gave people fodder for then the free time in the afternoon. And if there were, if they were early risers, um, the time that they had before um, the classes started. So yeah, I thought it was a good combination, a good balance. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. I forgot to mention that I would do these very early morning generative sessions at, at that particular one. The people who are willing to get up early. <laughs> I think if it were if if I were running this conference, which I think might have to do with the divine feminine, I'm just get or the the uh, the heroine's journey. I'm just guessing. Um, I would. Uh, I guess I would ask myself, what is it that I want to impart to the people who are going to be there? Because I happen to know a little bit about this retreat, and I know that um, if we can just say Kate, this is Kate's retreat, if I may. Um, and I know that she has a lot of, she's done workshops at mechanics that have been sold out. She has a lot to say and share from her own experience about the heroine's journey. And there's a big appetite for this. And so my suspicion is that in this particular case, you have a lot to impart and the people that are attending are looking to learn versus just have time, for example, to write. So my suspicion would be in this mm -hmm. case, just because I happen to have a little insight into this would be to maybe weigh it heavier on the side of, of learning. And then, and then I would also ask myself, that's what I'm thinking. I have to, to share whatever, but then what am I thinking? If I could put myself in the place of the attendees, what do I think they're probably wanting to take away from this and just kind of look at it from both sides. That would be sort of my, my way that I would probably approach it. Oh, thank you. Good advice. Thank you both for that. Um, any other questions from the audience, Nico? Um, I actually have a question that emerged from your conversation and it came up with what Cheryl said about writing retreats feeling kind of like church. So <laughs> um, so thinking about retreats as almost like a spiritual connection to the craft, how do you like intentionally design that into retreats to, to have it be a spiritual act. So I mean, Janice, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, Matthew, did you have a thought? Well, I was just gonna say that to me, creativity is inherently spiritual. You yeah. know, opening to the flow, however, whatever your version of spirituality is. Um, right. But to me, the creative process is inherently connecting to something greater than me. Um, so that that was just sort of my gut reaction to that versus a specific head-on answer to the question yeah. for which I'll turn it over to Janice. 
for that head on answer. <laughs> for that head, that on. head on answer. Yeah. So um, I come from, I approach it from maybe a slightly different point of view. I mean, I have been a writer much longer than I've been a meditator and Zen practitioner, but I have been those latter two things now for a while. And it occurred to me how much that changed my writing when I really developed a consistent meditation practice. Hmm. And so whenever I do a retreat, I try to find a way to tap into that. Very often the locations really lend themselves to that. If we're at Green Gulch Farm, that's part of San Francisco Zen Center, you know, the members are welcome to go into the Zendo to meditate and I'll do meditation, but tie it to the writing. Again, as I said before, the way that meditation and mindfulness can feed your writing, because, you know, our job as writers is to render the world on the page, but we cannot render the world on the page if we are not actually paying attention to the world. Right. So I feel like this is, this is sort of, it's my way to put in the spiritual aspect. <clears throat> and I do think um, Nico's right that, you know, retreat originally is a spiritual practice. Right. So I think it makes sense <laughs> to be thinking of your writing in those terms when you go away. It's a thing that you have now created a container for a separate time. And if I may add, um, so yes, yes, yes. Agree with all of the above. And um, Janice also does retreats at Esalen, which I can't remember if, you, if we've already mentioned Esalen, which is another just painfully spiritually charged place in the, in the best possible way. Um, <laughs> But I, I also just wanted to sort of piggyback and just sort of uh, agree with what Janice just said about meditation. I mean, I start off every day meditating, but also before I sit down to write, I usually do a little bit of meditation, which does two things, right? It, it clears my head, gets me out of the rational mind processing, you know, the monkey mind, as they say in Zen, and gets me into my body thereby opening me up to, to inspiration and to the flow and to whatever, again, spiritual sort of currents might might help us with the process but then if we talk about again this analogy or this metaphor of church of a retreat as a church i think another aspect of that is this communion that we get if we're going on a group retreat right that's what church for me at least growing up was largely about that communion and with that also the bearing witness that uh that comes into play so i think the the similarities are sort of multifaceted in, in that yeah sense. Yeah. So do we have any more questions from the audience, Nico? Uh, I just added that um, we should have time for one more question. So if any emergent questions are popping up in your brain right now, do add it to our chat. And, um, you know, I can follow up with another question, you know, like the the word retreat itself, some people interpret that as almost like you're going away and like running away from something. But we've been talking a lot about like communion, <laughs> yeah. right? And like conferencing, you know, like is retreat the right word for what some of these retreats actually are? You know, like I, I wonder about that linguistic choice that we have. I mean, for me, it goes back to, you know, I think the first question was, I can't remember how it was phrased, but just Janice and I both wholeheartedly agreed that, the, oh yeah, what, what are the benefits? Of what are the benefits? I think was yeah. right. And it's getting away from the day-to-day -day life, getting out of our houses. So for me, retreat is sort of the perfect word. <laughs> I'm not, I have no issues yeah. with the word yeah. retreat because, but I would also, I guess I would just add, I'm retreating from my day-to-day -day life, but there's also, I'm, I'm a going, I'm going towards something. Right? right. I'm going towards the peace. I'm going towards that time and space. So it's retreating in a sense, but not necessarily in a pejorative sense, because I'm also going someplace and that someplace is what I need. It's the time and space for my creativity, for myself, for communion with other like minded creatives. Um, but retreat works for me linguistically. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think, Nico, you bring up a good point. So the conference that Matthew was talking about where he was talking to agents and people like that. Um, I never called that a retreat. I called that a conference because right. it was very outwardly directed. It was the business side, publishing, 
Whereas the retreat that um, that she told did that was that was more of a retreat because yeah, I brought authors, but they just talked about the craft. We kind of purposely uh-huh. did not focus it on publishing. And that gave the writers the time and space to just think about, okay, the first step, which is write the best book I can. And so that I think does work for retreat. But when, yeah, when there's all those business components and you're more outwardly directed versus inwardly directed, I think conference is a better word than retreat. I think that's a good distinction. Yep, I agree. Yeah. I, I have a question about being at a retreat and um, thinking about going to one. Um, if you don't have any Wi-Fi or um, phone or any of that stuff, you have to rely on your memory and your feelings and all of that stuff that for some people may work just fine in a retreat setting, but for others, they might need a prompt. They might need materials that they bring with them. Do you do a take things with you? Do you have prompts? How do you um, remember what it is you want to write? Let me give you an example. I'm writing um, historical novels. I need to look stuff up. I mean, I need to do research. Do your retreats, are your retreats amenable to that sort of thing? You know, you bring up an interesting thing, Cheryl, because I've published two historical novels. And Sometimes I find that I would be on retreat and I didn't have that some research I wanted. You know, that's why they developed TK. (laughs) And I would just put it in there and go on. And I think particularly with historical fiction, you get caught up in the research. And sometimes, yes, it helps you decide what happens next. But I think we have to remember that it's the fiction part that's important, the storytelling. And so sometimes being a little separated from your research or taking an extra step to get to it might do some surprising things with your storytelling. Mm. And the other reality, so I I love that. I love that perspective, Janice. And then I would just add that the reality is even if we're at Esalen, which is in the middle of nowhere in Big Sur, there's still Wi-Fi, right? So usually it's hard in 2023. Um, You know, yes, like I mentioned, there are some cabins in the woods if we go far enough out that we're not going to have Wi-Fi. But it's hard in 2023, even if you're because most of these retreat places, most of their clients want Wi-Fi and expect Wi-Fi. So usually I think the problem isn't going to be what do I do without Wi-Fi? I think the bigger problem typically is how do I cut myself off from Wi-Fi so that I don't have that distraction? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and my question was was kind of um, really how do I bring the tools with me that I need to write what I'm going to write if I'm going on a retreat just for the isolation and the peace and quiet? I still I still want my material. I still want my tools. And and my it really how do you maneuver through that when you design a retreat for people like me who need that? Well, most except for my retreat in in Mexico, most of my retreats at least people from the Bay Area drive to. So you're just going to fill your trunk with all that stuff that even you're not even sure you're going to need it. And I will do that. Um, You know, I think that if you are going to do a retreat where you need to fly somewhere, then I recommend uploading everything so that you're right. You can find it or you'll have all the links you need so that you, you know, you don't get stymied. I do think a lot of it is just that feeling of security, knowing that if you needed it, it was there. Right. right. <laughs> so come come with your storyboard, in other words. Yeah. Come with your storyboard. How about you, Matthew? Anything to add to that? No, I mean, I have a big hard drive. So yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Most, most of it's going to be on the hard drive. I, I don't write historical fiction, for example. So I don't have... I don't need to bring 10 books with me, you know, that I that I might be using as contributing, you know, to to the research. I haven't done any intensively research. I mean, the only things that I might travel with sometimes are my handwritten journals because, you know, I journal Gosh. nonstop. So I guess that's the one maybe oh, yeah. where I have a physical thing that I want to bring with me. Um, but they're not, you know, so big that that's ever been a problem. Wonderful. Let me ask you both. Um, 
to just say anything that you want to say that I didn't ask about and, and also tell everyone what's coming up for you. Would you like to start, Matthew? Sure. Um, with regards to retreats, I don't know that there's anything that hasn't been discussed. So thank you for such thorough, good questions. I think we covered, you know, the essentials and then some. Um, I would just encourage people to do them. I guess that's where I would end with regards to retreats themselves. Uh, go on a retreat by yourself, go on a retreat with a group, just think about, again, your expectations and your objectives and, and find a retreat that looks like it's going to work for you. Ask people who have been on those retreats. You know, a lot of the retreats are happening yearly. So you yeah. can usually, you know, get some feedback from people. But I guess the short answer is just to do them. They can be really, really helpful and really help you get to the finish line. With regards to what I have coming up tomorrow, I'm doing, uh, this is more in the life coaching vein, but it certainly applies to, to writers as well. Uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m., I'm doing a holiday Thrivival event, ah. which is uh, on Zoom. And you can go to uh, lifecoachmatthew.com slash holidays. And, you know, I've just heard a lot of people talking about surviving the holidays. And so we're just going to have some conversation. This same setup is here. I'm going to bring some stuff from meditation, from the life coaching um program that in which I'm certified and just kind of talk about ways to not just get through the holidays but enjoy them despite some of the additional stress and stuff so that's what I have I saw, I saw your your I saw your promo on Facebook yeah well done Mr. Felix thank you very much <laughs> Janice anything um, I ask that you want to contribute and what you got coming up I got two things I'm really excited about coming up um, one is this Mexico retreat in San Miguel del Allende. It's uh, February 17th through the 23rd, which overlaps with the San Miguel Writers' Conference, which was very ah. serendipitous. Hmm. Um, I only have one spot left, uh, but if people go on the Lit Camp site, I, it's, it's a great, we just took over a little tiny hotel. So I'm super happy about that. Um, coming up in June, <laughs> excuse me, will be another of the sort of retreat with master classes will be the Lit Camp retreat at She Tell Dead. Um, I believe it's June 2nd through 7th. I will open for submissions in February. Okay. Um, I have on board Paul Harding, who has won the Pulitzer, but his most recent novel, This Other Eden, which is beautiful, was up for the National Book Award and the Booker this year. Wow. I have Layla Lalami, who is another Pulitzer finalist, and Lydia Kiesling, who um, has two novels, a, a recent eco novel called Mobility, I just think is terrific. So they'll be up along with myself doing the master classes. So those two things you can find on the litcampwriters.org site that I think will be someplace in the show notes. Um, but those are the two things I have coming up. Great. Anything you'd like to add about retreats just in general that I didn't ask? I'm going to just come down and agree with Matthew. Do them. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Nico, do you have anything else? Um, I just wanted to thank you and Janice and Matthew for joining us in this very generative conversation today. And I also wanted to just remind all of us that we do have a wonderful writer's lunch coming up on Friday, January 19th on the topic, how to craft a bio. I know a lot of us are thinking about writing, but sometimes we completely forget that we also have to think about what we are presenting in our own personal story through our bio. So that will be with um, Joey Garcia, Jeannie Grossenbacher, and Jillian Hamel. And it will be moderated once again by the wonderful Cheryl Bizet Boutte. Thank you all for being here today. Um, warm welcomes to all of you. And I hope to see you again. Uh, next month in January, okay, for the new year. And I'd like to add my thanks to Matthew, Janice, and to you, Nico, and the Mechanics Institute. Thank you so much. And everyone have a happy, happy weekend and happy holidays. Thank you. Stay well and Thank eat you. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.